Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, before we start, I need to explain something. When Freya was little, and people used to visit my studio, and they looked bemused at rows of My Little Ponies and unicorns and the doll's house, I felt I needed to explain, well, I share my studio with my daughter. And I feel I still have to do it, because nowadays the studio has weird body parts around, <laughs> like this person here. And that was from your um, life drawing class. Yes. Yeah. Good point. We should start with that, shouldn't we? This is Hippocrates, <laughs> and uh, he was joining me for my life drawing class today. And I want to say thank you to everyone who joined for that. It was very fun. Um, but yeah, all of these things take time to set up and dismantle. And I just kind of liked having him here. And he's heavy, so he's going to stay with us today. <laughs> I hope that's okay. And shall we talk about some bits and pieces as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A few years ago, when I was working on this project, which is... Atlantic's box set of um, all the Yes albums and the painting on it was one of my favourites of recent years, the Green Parrot Island. I made lots of coloured textures for the box. Painting, and another coloured texture. There was half a dozen in all. Let's have a look at that. And since then, We've had them printed on, as in this case, a plate. And I'll give that back to you, Fred. Mugs. And what are all these? So these are tea towels. So each tea towel goes, we showed these before, but we've got them done now. And we've got them done with a lovely edging, which I think gives them a sort of Romany gypsy sort of feel, which I really like. Um, but each pattern goes with one of the each of the mug designs as well, so you can get one to go with each matching. I'll show this one to you. So half of them have red trim and half of them have blue according to the design. But yeah, I'm very pleased with these. So we'll be getting these up on the website as soon as we've sent them to the fulfillment house, which will be in the next couple of days. And then they'll be up. And these? We also experimented with masks. I want to do some more designs with Dad's logo pictures on. So maybe the paper tiger tiger and some of the insects. But I started with the paintings. Um, so we've got one morning dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to try one? Well, this one yeah, has you got your name in the too. title. Yeah. We can't share them or mix around. Um, these we want to put up on the website as well, don't we? Um, but I just wanted to get some prototypes. I'll show you that one. So this is Blue Desert. These are a little bit big on me because I ordered a sort of large size which I thought would fit everyone and it does fit me, it just is a bit big but I have a very unusually small head so that L size should be good for most people. Did you put both on? No. You didn't try this one? No, you can try it. I only tried this one. And we've got, of course, tails as well. So those are the painting ones, and I'm going to do some logo ones as well. But I wanted to start with the paintings because I thought they'd be something very beautiful. And with the logos, I think we'll do something a bit more fun and strange. Um, but I've got to sort out the prototypes of those. But these are good, so hopefully we're going to order a few of these to go up on the website as well. Right. And that's, is that all of our yeah. mugging? No, you've got the Q&A. No, we've got the Q&A. <laughs> Okay, so these, as usual, are the questions from this week. This is Monday the 22nd of June, 
and I've been learning how to pronounce people's names because some of you have been joining my classes recently. So I've definitely learnt how, well, how not to pronounce them anyway. So this is a question from Garlen. Um, would lower gravity inflatable structure covered with some slurry of ice be stronger and reduce the volume of materials in cargo load of transport vehicle? Sounds like a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what's happened here. My Facebook is in Japanese. <laughs> Sometimes when it tells me what someone's written, it translates and then retranslates. So some of the questions may be phrased slightly trickily. Yeah. Well, Sh should we start with the next one? <laughs> well, let's come back to that one then. We'll that make one. sure we remember Good to come start. back. Good start. Okay. <laughs> Jacques asks, we have a mayor here in Nantes who must... Uh, who just makes boxes after destroying nice old houses. Can you come and brief her about what is good to live in? <laughs> well, that's a problem, isn't it? I was once very kindly invited to, um, to Sweden to talk to the mayor. Uh, how do you pronounce the name of that town? Gothenburg or Jotobori. Yes, that's the one. And to talk to them about making they were concerned to make a city that was amenable to children so i did talk to them about not only making architecture that makes people feel good but also addressing issues like urban pathways and all kinds of other spaces that all contribute to a sense of safety and well-being so i have done that but i suspect if i invited myself i get very short shrift so, so you have to persuade her to invite me and then I'd very happily come Mike asks have you adapted any part of your house architecturally or environmentally or kept it traditional I think we would appreciate a brief tour around at later point well okay well first of all um, we are going to be bringing the prototype here and that will be absolutely as you've seen it in the books of it very curvilinear with the doors and windows and everything in keeping but the building we're in is actually a very old barn and it's listed it's a historical building so we are limited with what we can do with it and I wouldn't really want to mess with it because it's a big space it isn't really like a home it's it's a studio which I live in um, but when we've got the thing moved, then you'll see. Then, then we'll very happily show you when we have that prototype here and finished. Do you know what I was renovated? I was thinking about it the other day, and I was sort of I was going somewhere, and I was all dressed up, and I had my handbag and my little shoes, and I was coming down the stairs, and they were all wonky, and there were bits hanging out of them, and there were dead spiders over my head, and you know. Yeah. racks of canvases everywhere and I just thought this isn't me this isn't me this needs to be sorted out or I need my own wing <laughs> if I'm going to be here any length of time it's too deconstructed for my liking it is just a studio that you live in isn't it really it is yeah which is fine Kevin asks it may have been said already. Have you seen the curved design of Pierre Cardin's house, similar to yours in some way? Yes. Yes. I had a visit from some architects. We're talking a very, very, very long time ago, who came to my studio and they said they were inspired by my designs and they built this building in the south of France. And they would like to work with me and I thought well they told me the building was very much inspired by my work and I was I said well thank you that's very nice that's very flattering but I felt they should have talked to me before they did it about working with them rather than after anyway yes I, I was aware of it and I had some I'm, I'm assuming it's the same building 
but yeah these young guys who designed and built this thing down there very interesting I think I've got one of his skirts he's a fashion designer I think oh right right yeah he, I, he had nothing to do with, with the design of it then. right right okay so Anders asks have you any photos in good shape left from the jazz club you worked on um, where it did not work out like you wanted is this still your translation from your website no this is perfect English I am um, just wondering what which one he means so he asks if you've got any photos left from the jazz club uh, where it didn't work out like you wanted but I thought the only jazz club I know that you did was the Ronnie Scott's that's right yeah um, well the answer to that would be yes there's pictures of it in views and yeah somewhere in the archives we have more photos maybe we should show those at some point because it seems to be um, an important catalyst for everything else yeah particularly the furniture and yeah we can do that architectural stuff I don't think I've seen them in the book I don't think I've seen them <laughs> okay <laughs> I haven't read your books <laughs> apparently not We'll get back to that. Um, okay, so Garland asks um, again a different question. Um, I think this this might make more sense. Did you ever explore inflatable form work to establish the first shell, then reinforce before continuing with final construction? Yes, we did. We worked actually with Dunlop for quite a few years. Um, the real problem was that the Dunlop makes shapes already for making all kinds of structures in gunite, so they're very familiar with the process. Their concern was they'd never been asked to make anything that required real precision. Um, they make slugs for making um, gunite. Uh, conduits for water and they spray them and they continually pull this along and they keep spraying around it and they continually pull it along so it's um, they've they've had experience with certain things but when we try to get precision into the process it was much more difficult and by then we'd invented if you like another method of making these and that superseded a great deal of the inflatable and what the inflatable could do we could actually um, build it in a much simpler way we are still using um, flexible mold but they're not inflatable and we will for certain types of building where symmetry counts and precision doesn't we will use inflatables but um, yeah in, in views I've got a drawing of the whole of a three-story structure all built with inflatables um, doable but difficult to do with any degree of precision so it's not a route we're currently investigating for most of it. As I say, we have a system that's much easier, much quicker, much more precise. What I do want to do, though, and we talked about this before, which is not related to the architecture exactly, but make some big inflatable 3D art experiences that would be like a sort of cross between a bouncy castle and team lab in Tokyo and projections and different kinds of um, textures and maybe some water involved. I really want to make, and maybe you, there's a theme with a lot of the things that I'm interested in. I want to make a big kind of structure that um, allows you to pass through the alimentary canal of the human body. <laughs> <laughs> as if you were a bit of food I think that would be really great fun 
So, but it's all inflatable, so you get so you go down the, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, there'll be like the stomach bit, um, but you go through the throat and all, and then all the intestines, like all these like inflatable tubes, you have to sort of get. Yeah, I just think that would be really great fun, and you know, educational. Well. In a completely different direction, we have built inflatable stages that were very big and good fun. So we should talk about stages because Freya's worked with me on the stages. So, hmm. I really like the idea of inflatables, though. I like them because it's something portable, and it's something. I don't know. I think it's got a lot of scope for having a light footprint in the world, and you can take it anywhere and bring it to people who might not be able to afford going to you know the center of some cosmopolitan city mm. there are a number of projects involving hello kitty hello we, we kitty. have a visitor <laughs> <laughs> um so that sort of brings us to the next question don't <laughs> <laughs> okay we have a vet. Oh. We have a visitor. Oh, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. Keep going with the question. Okay. From the designs for construction, did this also inform or influence your designs for stage sets? In Yes, in one occasion. One of the sets we did for the opera was very much based on a drawing for a village. And, uh, yeah. But most of the sets we did for Yes were, were bioluminescent landscapes and not architecture. But the opera was a piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that really strange? Stay with the questions, oh, girl. Pay I'm attention. Horribly distracted. <laughs> so, so stay with the questions. Do you think of the effect of architecture on people's behaviour and state of mind? Now, I know this is sort of um, what you did. This was your whole ethos behind the architecture. But I kind of like the implication that it might affect behaviour as, well as, as well as state of mind. That's Carol's question. Right. Well, the idea about it, the architecture, is to make people feel at ease, to feel at peace, to feel tranquil. And to that extent, it worked. To well, to a very large extent, that worked. Um, when we came to choreographing pathways, we've put a lot of theory of that together, but without actually building significant pathways. Um, but I think it would. I think if you're talking about an urban pathway where people feel much safer, I think. It will affect their behaviour in a positive way. Yeah. But what about things like um, government institutions, educational institutions? What if you're thinking about like schools and prisons and, you know, whatever your kind of idea about prisons or education is, if you're thinking in terms of behaviour as opposed to just how people feel? Right. Do you think something about architecture can make people behave in certain ways? Yes, uh, very definitely. Um, we've not looked at prisons, but we have looked at schools and designed a couple of schools. And we've looked with a great deal of interest at hospitals. Um, there's a, quite a body of evidence to say that if a hospital is designed with the state of mind of the patient as the as a primary concern, you can actually make hospitals where people heal quicker than in a conventional hospital. And sometimes things as simple as being able to see a tree from a hospital bed can have a big difference on the outcome of a stay in hospital. So I think there's a lot of psychology to be looked at there and a lot of rethinking about structures that are supposed to help people heal yeah because i think a lot of thinking has gone into it in terms of controlling people and making money if you think of the panopticons that's such a 
for me an inhumane way of designing a building and there's mm. got to be some kind of reverse of that. I suppose the reverse of that is buildings that have lots of corridors and nooks and crannies and feel natural, feel like a root system. Um, but if I'm thinking about architecture affecting behaviour, we were talking about it yesterday, the fact that so near where we live, um, they've cut a load of trees down on this hill and it's exposed this footpath to suddenly be visible from all the roads on both sides and I run up there and suddenly from that whole area being somewhere I try and get through as quickly as possible because it felt really uncomfortable I feel like totally relaxed there now just because two roads see me whereas before only one did and only in parts and so there is something about <laughs> in terms of the infrastructure of cities and towns as well that I think could affect people's behaviour in terms of being safer. Yeah. It's, I mean, excuse me, oh. you're going to have to sit on your own. <laughs> There's, um, if you imagine at night and you're walking along and you need to go down a small, let's say alleyway, narrow road, and right at the entrance to that there's a light if you're walking down that road with the light behind you, you cannot see what's what might be in ambush, and so you would. It, it's quite an intimidating experience. The ideal situation is there's a light source where you're going, so that you can at each step it gets brighter and clearer. It, there's lots of things we can do about choreographing our way around a city that not only makes it safer, but as important, it makes it feel safer. Um, and the opposite is equally true. You know, a lot of modern buildings are incredibly oppressive, make people feel intimidated and uncomfortable. And, you know, are places where crime easily occurs and we could make it where it doesn't easily occur. Sometimes it's not obvious. I was looking at uh, some defendable spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a tendency to think that a house is more secure with a high wall. But there's a, a lot of research that shows the opposite is true. If you're overseen by five or six neighbours and you equally overlook each other's property, the fact that it's overseen makes it more secure than if there's a high wall where an intruder only has to get over the wall and then they're out of sight. So it's not always obvious, It's but yes, we could make cities that are w really wonderful places and we, we're not doing that and we need to. We need to make more demands on people who make these kinds of decisions. Planners are amazingly protective from influence, but we have to speak up as people and say, we want better, we want you guys to do better. And I think anything that sort of would get away from the solution just being more cameras would be good because I think the thing is... Well, more cameras are useful after the event. Yeah. What you want to do is prevent mm. negative events. Mm. And that can be done. Mm. Okay, Maybe. Kaya asks, for pen and ink drawings, do you use fountain dip or disposable fine liner pens? Actually, I use two types of pen. I use a rotring mechanical pen, which it does have ink. It can, tends to be in refillable cartridges and it can be very fine line. But the name gives you a clue about the problem. It's a mechanical pen and the line is, or tends to be, amazingly consistent. You can vary it a little by rocking it, but that's unsatisfactory. So I do drawings with a dip pen and Indian ink, and I love that. Um, 
So those are the two pens I use. Uh, the mechanical pens come in a range of sizes and the dip pens come in a fabulous array of all kinds of little boxes of different nibs, which I love, but I tend to always use the same one. You can make a dip pen out of anything, can't you, really? If oh, you just I've stick got some one of those nibs on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got some fabulous ones made out of bamboo, actually, mm. as well as quills. Mm. But the bamboo ones come in a whole array of different sizes. I use dip pens as well. I like those a lot, but I particularly like using them. We've tried to find it before and it was difficult, but I really liked using scraper board. Yes, me too. It's fabulous to draw on, but it gives you the opportunity of drawing in black and in white. Mm. And that's, that, that makes for a wonderful variety of lines. It does, but also you can get so much more um, levels of grade uh, shadow. Tone. Tone, yeah. um, because obviously if you're working in a dip pen, the more you build up, the darker it gets. But there's, you know, to a certain extent, you can't go any further and that can build up quite quickly. But if you can then also scrape it off, that's sort of just a whole new range of light and dark that you can get mm. in there. Bristol board and the old um, um, CS10, which is no longer available, you could scrape those. You could draw black with something like a scalpel blade. You could draw in, by scraping them off. But nowhere near as good as scraper board. Scraper board, after all, is designed for it. It has a very high kaolin content, which makes it that scratch line super crisp and super white. Mm. Fountain pens, if that's all I have, that's all I have. And I'll draw with anything if that's all I have. But given a choice, I would draw with the two pens I've described. Dad and I have been talking about coming up with a kind of school. So obviously we've been doing Dad's courses and I do my classes and courses as well. But we've been talking about sort of collating it into a school and doing courses, long-term ones like Dad's and mine and one-off short courses um, about how to do specific things. Um, but I was just just thinking about it in terms of the scraper board. It would be great if we could come up with a line of products as well and materials like scraper board, which no <laughs> one seems to make anymore. But I think is well, there were two things that used to be made in terrific abundance, um, and then kind of disappeared and a little bit creeping back. I remember when I did drawings in ink, and over a very short time they used to fade. Yet if you were lucky enough to go in a auction or an antique shop and buy a sepia drawing from a previous century, the color is as rich and strong as ever. So my question is, why isn't anyone making that high quality sepia ink? Further than that, I when I used to work um, at the Welcome Collections Pathology Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, I was in the conservation department, so I was where they kind of repotted everything and took care of it and restrung it inside the jars. And what was absolutely amazing. Don't, don't ask what those everythings were. You know, these <laughs> things, uh, but real. <laughs> and what was amazing, which I didn't realise, was. Um, the ones that they have now, all of any diagrams that they have are on a separate sheet of paper and you have the name at the bottom. But the ones, the specimens they used to pot a hundred years ago had little labels on, stuck on to the body parts inside the jar because the ink was so good that it stayed on the paper, even in the formaldehyde. The paper was so good that it stayed paper structure even inside the formaldehyde. The glue was so good, the paper stayed stuck to the body part, even in these sort of alcohol formaldehyde solutions. And they're still perfect. You can still pick it up and it's sort of wobbling around, but it's still got the label stuck on. And they can't do that now. It's, there's nothing you can use that will be stable enough to keep the label on the specimen inside the jar. And I thought that was amazing, mm. how much better those kind of things were. 
But I'm sure there's lots of good reasons and rules as to why they don't do it that way anymore. And probably you wouldn't want to be sticking things on to the specimens. But as they could, as they I could. guess they did. Okay, next question. Yeah. So Laura asks, would a person slash firm who is interested in constructing an eco-village to these specs just be able to reach out and contact you to collaborate with you? What would, uh, what would you need from them to collaborate with them? Okay. Hello, Laura. Um, there, were, there were periods when we used to get asked a very great deal and we used to say to people, okay, do you have a site? Do you have the resources? I mean, is it just an idea that you want to build something? In which case the issue would be, okay, when you're a little bit further down the line, we can help, but we can't help you necessarily find a site. Actually, weirdly, in some cases we could. But the answer is simple. Um, yes, we're easy to find. Um, in for rogerdean.com and we would look at every inquiry but we would at some early point need to make sure it was credible what do you need from them to collaborate with them well i think let's assume that they have a empathy with our goals ethically and environmentally they would need to be when I say credible they would need to have the resources or the site or some part of the equation and the equation the three things that building projects stumble over is that they have two or one of the three but not all three you have a site you have planning consent and you have funding. If all three are lined up, it's a no-brainer. Typically, it's usually two of the three and the third has to be aligned as quickly as possible because planning consents are time sensitive. Offers of funding are often time sensitive. It's, it's a, the trick is getting all three of those elements at once but yeah uh, that's all that would be required some part of that at least next question yeah michael asks are you sympathetic with the principles of the arts and crafts movement in that possessions are best if they are either beautiful or useful i think that was that was a william morris quote wasn't it I think so, yeah. Never own anything you don't believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. Yes. Um, and empathise with their rebellion against mass manufacture in favour of artistic creation. Simple answer is I absolutely love the arts and crafts movement. I think it's a great shame it hasn't thrived for longer, but People change their thinking when big events like world wars come along. But the arts and crafts movement wanted their stuff to be available to ordinary people. And because it was made to such high standards by hand, it was often completely out of reach of ordinary people. So in that respect, it failed. But in terms of it being fabulous and beautiful and inspirational it was it, it really worked but it was what great. if what if dad we made a school where we taught people how to make things to that standard themselves then people could make their own you know hand carved <laughs> even so even so it's, it's, a, it's a slow way to change the world but that's how pe i think that's how humans do things you know, I think we need to work less and spend. I think if we've learned anything from the last year so far, it's that we all like being at home much more than I think we've ever had a chance to. We like doing DIY. 
I think in that first like couple of weeks of lockdown, everyone was ordering paint from Homebase and B&Q and Amazon because everyone was repainting their own homes. Mm. You had all of these memes of people decorating by hand and you know just all of this DIY remodeling. All of the builders are booked mm. up in month months in advance still. Yeah, it's one industry that isn't suffering. Yeah, and I think it's because when people get a little breather from having to work constantly to survive, they love doing their own homes up. And there is something else as well. We tend to, obviously, in not in what we do, but yeah, in what you do, um, we're paid by the hour, not by productivity. And one of the things that has been very clear not everybody, but a significant number of people have proved to be more productive at home than they are going in, spending hours or two hours traveling in and out of work. At home, they can get rid of their daily work quota in a fraction of the time, maybe a big fraction, like half the time, but nevertheless, they can get it done and have a lot more breathing space. So I think we should learn about doing things differently. But the challenge here is to say whether or not I sympathize with their rebellion against mass manufacture. And there is a lot of things that we have in our daily lives where the fact that they're mass produced is reassuring as much as it can be concerning. For example, if these were handmade, it'd be lovely. If this table was handmade, sure. I'm not so sure I would want my Mac to be handmade. <laughs> there was that guy, I think, um, I think he was a friend of Becky's, or the son of her friend, and he went to the Royal College of Art, and for his master's project, he built a toaster from scratch. And he went to all of these countries to source the copper and then handmade the copper wires and built the whole thing and then tried to make a piece of toast with it and it just exploded. Um, <laughs> which makes your point, I suppose. I don't know. I, it may have But worked, it took him yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> I think it took him a really, really long time. And then they sold it in John Lewis. Yes. In the toaster section. Well, let me recommend something we have a whole load of William Morris's books here and they are they're not necessarily a light read I, I, let's just put it that way but I love the physical products of the arts and crafts movement but I would like to su suggest you review how you look at it through the eyes of say David Pye because David Pye wrote a book on craftsmanship and he acknowledged two entirely different types of craftsmanship one was that of the potter where the thumbprints of the potter can be seen on the finished item and the beauty of it is enhanced by the low-tech manufacturing process but at the other extreme there might be something like, I don't know, a beautifully made steam engine, which is made one at a time to a large degree, or something like... Canterbury Cathedral. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, no, that is handmade. But I was thinking what David Pye did is he contrasted the handmade with the machine made. And if you think of a beautifully made car or watch or something, Things that are machine made can be beautiful and can have a high level of craftsmanship as well as things that are made entirely by hand. It's, it's not an easy answer to say I agree with their rebellion against mass projection because I think making a better world has to be for everybody because part of it being a better world is knowing there's as as a society we treat everybody fairly and reduce suffering 
as much as society is capable of doing it and we make the benefits of a better world as near to universal as it's possible. So I, I think you need to address that issue as well. So you need craftsmen making things that enhance people's lives to the extent we can see it has health benefits and then offer vases on the NHS, for <laughs> example. And then it can be for everyone. No, I, no, think, okay. I think anyone could have access to it because, first of all, anyone could make it. I mean, the person who is making a pot this Mo is what I said. We teach people in our school. There you go. I think people can make things and trade them with other people who make different things. But also, there's tons of things in the world already that are handmade and beautiful that you can buy for nothing if you're willing to get them second hand. Yeah. <laughs> with a little chip in them. <laughs> and then you can do a bit of, you know, kintsugi, where you repair ceramics with gold and then stick the chip back in. Yes, I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, if we did that with more things, maybe we could all have a little bit of handmade. Some things are eminently suitable for repairs. Uh, you can look at a, a well, I've, I've been looking at 100 year old steam engines and they are massively restored and they look as beautiful or more beautiful than the day they were first built. It's a harder thing to feel you could do with a plastic vacuum cleaner, for example. Mm. That's not so amenable to restoration. Sort of on this subject, Kaya has asked me a question. She says, Freya, you always have such lovely dresses on. Thank you, Kaya. <laughs> do you ever design your own clothing? <laughs> I do, but you've asked me something that's sort of very close to the subject that we're just talking about. Pretty much all of my clothes are second hand and 90% of them are vintage Laura Ashley dresses. And one of the reasons that I love her stuff is because she had everything handmade and she hired local people in the town where she was, I can't remember the name of the town, it was Mahuntleth. in Mahuntleth in Wales and they were really struggling because um, the mines were closing up so families, the fathers who were doing the mining were losing their jobs so what Laura Ashley did is she hired local women to do all the sewing so she kept the business local because they were losing lots of people to the bigger towns and what she also did was she told them they could work from home. So she brought the fabric to them at the beginning of the week, left it with them and on Friday picked up the dresses. So it meant that women who had children could work as well. And I really liked the idea of that. Um, it meant, you know, she supported an entire community with that business and they're incredibly well made. They're all handmade from that kind of early period, obviously, like when they sold Laura Ashley to some huge eastern conglomerate then that completely changed um but before it was all based on the idea of um you know using good materials she never used uh, synthetic materials everything's cotton or linen or silk um and really beautifully done and somehow they managed to do it so it was relatively affordable it wasn't you know high-end um Prices. There's a company in Lewis that is doing that now. Oh, we really? should go and see them, yeah. Who's that? I can't remember their name. Oh, that's a shame. We could have given them a plug. Well, we'll next put it time. In the link. <laughs> next <laughs> time. Next time. Yeah. But I think that's a really good way of doing things. I think Etsy is a fantastic resource for everything that you'd want. I pretty much get everything off there. But you also bought, I remember, you used to buy second hand. Japanese dresses that were made in a Western style, didn't you? Yeah, so this is a really interesting back and forth. I used to buy Japanese dresses from the 70s made in the style of Western dresses from a Korean lady in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and she had this fantastic selection because they were the most incredible colours because in Japan they're obviously a lot less colour averse 
than the European designs at the time. So they'd be these very nice sort of like A-line skirted, hourglass shaped dresses, but in these all these bright exotic colours. And I used to really love them. But since I moved to Japan, I've just sort of been picking them up there. Yeah. I did love those. How many more questions? Huh? Yeah. We've got one more question. And this is Kaya as well. Hmm? Then we need to go back to the first one. Then we need to go back to the first one. Okay. So Kaya asked, I want to create during every waking second, but I often have no idea what to draw or paint, etc. Do you have any methods of everyday drawing exercises? I, I have tried to say this all the time. And Freya says, oh, Dad, you know, boring. Get on with the drawing, painting, whatever. Um, but it, it is that issue of taking your mind out of the equation. If you've got a pencil and paper in your hand and you're listening to something totally gripping, just let it go. Don't try. Absolutely don't try. Doodling is should be fun and it should be a discovery, not something you order your hand to do, but something you, as it were, discover that your hand can do. So relax, get distracted by a great story and just let go. Um, actually, Kaya, I think I've mentioned before, she, I hope I'm saying your name right, we'll have to catch up on that, um, joined my self-portrait class today. And I've been told several times, drawing yourself, drawing your own face is a really good exercise to do every day because basically you can't get it. You, it's very obvious if you get it wrong. If you draw a flower or an animal, then you can kind of fudge it slightly. And it, even if you don't get it exactly right, no one will know unless they compare it to the original image or thing. But if you mess up doing your own face, it's immediately obvious. So that's a really good way of watching yourself progress. And uh, the best way to do it apparently is you do one every day in your sketchbook and you turn the page and you don't look at the original one till you've got through the whole book. And the other thing that I really like about drawing yourself, um, we talked about this earlier today, is I think it's a really healthy way of looking at yourself if you're looking at your face to get to know the shapes of it and you know the bits that are hard lines and the bits that are soft lines and the different sort of contours and curves of all of you know the shapes here I think it's a really lovely way of getting to know yourself I think you know a lot of all of us live in cultures where there are certain ways faces should look I live in Japan and in England and so strangely I'm exposed to two quite different uh, beauty standards for people you know that it like in Japan it's very desirable to have small faces in England no one has even considered that <laughs> it's like saying it's very beautiful to have small elbows just nobody thinks about it um, but each culture has these and I think drawing your face really carefully is a really healthy way of just becoming familiar and building an affectionate relationship with how you look that's totally unrelated to any other imagery and I think it's I think it's just a really lovely thing to do mm. well it's, if you're looking for something to do every day and all the time it's free as well you don't have to pay a model you're just there whenever you want so <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, it's, it's even better than dad's, dad's go-to is find a log. You don't even have to go anywhere to find a log. You're just here. <laughs> so I would recommend getting a little sketchbook and just doing your face every day, just a little one. Even if it's just five, ten minutes, whatever you My log it was a one-off. <laughs> was it? Okay. <laughs> okay, back to that first question. Okay. I still haven't got a clue what, what it okay. means. With lower gravity inflatable structure covered with some slurry of ice would be stronger and reduce volume of materials in cargo load of transport vehicle. So, um, so this is um, related to... Oh wait, I can't figure this 
that. <laughs> I feel like there's a very interesting idea here. Okay. And my mind can't get around it. No. Ga Galen? Is that how you pronounce it? Galen? Galen. I think. Okay. I know you can write to us. So, yeah. I think we need to get that question. <laughs> it's in a w slightly differently. I'm sure it will come um, very obvious what you're talking about with a slightly different wording. Mm. Yeah, it sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for joining my class today as well. Carlin jo joined my class today. Okay. As well, well are there, is there any other business, anything else we need to say? Um, we'll be back on Monday. Yes. Over the weekend, we're going to decide whether Monday is going to be about logos or stages. And we're going to have two sessions on sequential weeks. One talking about logos and fonts. And I've got sketchbooks for the font ideas. And the other one will be stages. And the beauty of that is that um, Freya and I have collaborated there. Mm. And um, as usual, I always say as well, we, so we do, we stop doing our Wednesday live because we're doing this private course. Um, we're coming up to the third week next week and it's been amazing and so much fun with everyone. Um, so we definitely want to do it again, don't we? Yeah. And um, so if you want to join for the next one, email info at rogerdean.com and we'll let you know as soon as we've got dates for the next one. If you want to join any of my classes, you can follow me on Instagram and it's just Freya, F-R-E-Y-J-A, Dean. Um, and I update when I have a new class coming up. Um, have we got anything else that we need to tell people about? Otherwise it's 7 p.m. as usual in British summertime. Yes, we okay. had um, this last, Wednesday, we had uh, Matt Sunderland filming. So um, that meant we, we had multiple cameras and we could edit on the fly. And it was wonderful technology to have. And at least on Monday, we'll have him again. So. But he's, he's shooting our classes from now on. So by the end of next week, we'll have the course fully formed and professionally filmed and edited yeah but we still do the live ones every week as well mm. that's it thank you very much indeed <laughs> hope to see you monday see you on monday